next talk uh, for this morning session will be given by uh, Mark Edmondson, and he will be talking about evolving R with uh, Docker and the cloud. And uh, Mark is a data engineer at IIH Nordic, and he's also one of the uh, uh, active contributors to the Copenhagen R user group, and he's been given uh, talks there. So uh, we are very much looking forward to hear what you have to say. So I'm, uh, this is the most illustrious audience I've ever presented to, so I'm pretty nervous, but I hope uh, I can get through it. And um, this is a good talk. This is like a passion of mine, this niche that I've found myself in, uh, R and the cloud. And um, yeah, so this is something I really like to talk about, so hopefully that people are interested. Um, yeah, and this is basically the plot sort of my journey. Um, through how I've been using R over the years and how that sort of moved into the cloud and the job that I'm doing. <clears throat> so um, this is kind of shadowing uh, a blog post that I did uh, in the sort of prep for this. So I did a blog post uh, about this. Um, so um, yeah, there's a bit more detail on there if you, if you want to hear that afterwards. Um, so just talk about myself a little bit because uh, so you have to. Um, but the um, basically I started in... Uh, digital marketing about 2006 in Cornwall in the UK. Um, and then I moved to uh, Denmark just to sort of uh, start to learn on the web analytics side of uh, digital marketing. Um, got really into that and then met my wife, so decided to stay in Denmark. Um, and then um, actually from my wife, uh, one of the tasks was um, from work was, how do, you, how do you forecast this web analytics data? We've got all this marvelous data, how do we sort of start to do something with it? And she had a friend who worked at the uh, University of Copenhagen who said, oh, you've got to use R, you've got to use R. So um, I sort of give it a go. And um, it worked, and I really got into it and the passion for it and everything. Um, and then I started um, sort of uh, using it in my work, and I created some open source packages uh, on GitHub initially. Um, and then, um, a, a, uh, yeah, and basically I just sort of started to move into the clouds through my work because uh, we were dealing with larger and larger amounts of data and we had to process it in the cloud. But I always wanted to use R to do that processing, so I kind of tried to make this glue in between the, you know, my love of R and the sort of cloud stuff that um, I had to use. Um, and then I had this, uh, this shiny app that went viral on Twitter, um, and uh, that kind of really opened up a lot of like, career opportunities for me. So I can definitely say R has really helped me in, uh, in my career in doing so. Um, and this is like, um, it got me into the Google Developer Expert program, for instance, for Google Analytics and Google Cloud. And it was featured on our studio showcase for a while and things like that as well. So um, that was maybe uh, a sort of watershed moment for me. <clears throat> and I've um, basically been developing these packages over the years. And they're very sort of digital marketing focused at the start. But this kind of plots my kind of evolution as I've been going on as well. I started off in SEO and I needed the search console data from, uh, from Google. Then I moved into Google Analytics. Then I needed to sort of generalize the, auth the authentication of those uh, packages. Um, so we used a uh, Google Auth bar. And then um, because Google has this sort of meta API that creates its APIs, you can use that to generate code for other Google APIs. So uh, I started to use that to generate uh, compute engine uh, libraries, cloud storage libraries. Um, Google Language R is the, uh, one which uh, calls the uh, natural language processing API and text-to-speech and things like that. So that's quite a nice one. And the very latest one that I kind of did in time for this conference was Google Cloud Runner. And it kind of is sort of my uh, accumulation, accumulation of uh, every, everything I've been thinking about and using R in the cloud. I think so. So um, this is kind of my little corner of the, of the CRAN universe. It's by no means uh, SP or SF, in, but it's just sort of my little corner. And um, Google Author is kind of the main sort of dependency on all the packages that I make, but it's nice that other people are starting to pick it up as well. Now, it's just me doing Google Author, so it's not a good idea to have that single point of failure. So it's nice that um, our studio with Jenny uh, is uh, now doing Gargle, which is going to be uh, basically take over the role of Google Author in the future as a sort of move more and more functions into it. And basically what I want to talk about today is just um, the sort of abstraction 
of what happened when I was thinking about R and um, the sort of thinking that went behind how I kind of started to use it, how it changed my thinking of using R and how Docker was so instrumental to that. I really think if there's one thing you can remember from today, if you want to get into this, is Docker, Docker, Docker. It's just like, it is the key for everything. So I'll talk about that later. And then I'm no way as brave as to launch a version of R live in, uh, in front of everyone. So I've got a demo, but it's, I cheated with a few of the videos. So uh, we'll see how that goes. And then just, I'm going to sort of talk about, you know, the thinkings and my journey from making the APIs all the way down to serverless computing with R that's uh, happening. So, yeah, so R on the cloud, and it's really, yeah, it's a journey of Docker in, the, in, a, in many, many ways. <clears throat> so who here hasn't heard of Docker? Okay, cool, cool, a smattering. Okay, so it's worth sort of going over this. So Docker is ba uh, a system where it's like a little virtual machine that you run on your machine. And it's, uh, you may have things like VMware and things that you've come across, and big, but Docker is a sort of system to uh, make that so that you can run on your machine little completely separate environments from the machine that you're running on. So you could be running Mac and you run a Docker container which is running Linux, for example. And in general, I'm sure everyone's heard of the cloud, but cloud is basically someone else's computer. Uh, but up in the uh, up in the cloud, and you connect to it via web APIs, and it, it offers um, you off-sourcing uh, all of your computing power that you have on your laptop. You can sort of move that up into the cloud and let them uh, handle it. And sort of serverless is this new kind of word that's sort of coming in now, and it's kind of the combination of these two worlds. Uh, we've got cloud services, and they often use Docker to package up your code. And then they take care of all the details, and you just sort of run your code or application on top. And so serverless really means uh, no config server. I mean, it's not. There's obviously a server running under that, but you don't know. The, you don't need to know the details of that. So that's sort of the offering they offer you. Um, let let us take care of all the sort of boring DevOps stuff, which you need to do to set up a computer. You just run your application on top. And it's these things that really sort of. Uh, helps us at work in what we're doing is that we can actually focus on the R code and developing that rather than all the sort of meta, meta code that you have to do for setting these things up and servers and all of this. And uh, for our applications at IH Nordic, we're, uh, you know, a lot of the time is spent just how do we take this code and make it so that it's available to the customers. And, you know, most of the time is spent in that engineering uh, rather than the sort of statistics and modeling and things like that in that. So how to make that as easy as possible is a big thing for us. A really big thing as well is that it scales from zero to billions. So what that means is that you can deploy this stuff, but you're only charged when it's being used. So it's, the, it's basically free to sort of put it up there. And then once people start using it, then you get charged, which means you can sort of pre-load all these applications. And when they get popular, then you start to pay for it. But there are generous free tiers as well. Um, so to get started, you're usually not paying anything to get, to get into there. Um, also, reliability and security. Um, you know, the cloud vendors are much more advanced in uh, doing all this stuff, keeping up with patches and things like that than us developing it. So we can kind of off-source that responsibility to them. And they offer this sort of abstraction. This is something they've kind of offered to me. Is, uh, they make, they've made me think about applications in a, in a way that sort of scales well for the cloud, but it's also helpful for... Um, for the applications that we're working on. <clears throat> so this is kind of um, where my journey sort of started, and I, you know, I think a lot of people go through this, is that you start at the bottom, where you're just looking at R code running in the console, and you're going through the R learning curve, right, of like, you know, how does all this work and all of that. And th then you start sort of wrapping up useful <coughs> R uh, code into functions, so that you can use a, the re repeatability, reproducibility of that. And then if you get quite a lot of good functions all together, then you sort of package them together into an R package and put them on CRAN or CRAN, as I'm learning, you should say. Um, so, um, yeah, so then you're sort of on packages. But then we, I, I've had, I needed to sort of think about that a little bit beyond that, because it's like, once you have these R packages, um, as we talked about with dependencies, SF and SP, suddenly something updates and everything goes sort of wrong in your code. And if you, that's running in production, that's bad news, because you have to talk to the client and say, yeah, sorry, deploy are updated and it yeah, ruined my uh, <laughs> nesting of my data flow and things like that. So I really started to think about how do you pin down the version of um, the R packages that you're using. 
and then also the environment, so all the sort of system dependencies that these are packages are depending on, how do you pin those down so that it's very reliable what you're running on and uh, you don't have to sort of get a phone call on Sunday afternoon saying, oh dear, you know, this is broken. And then, so, and once we have that, then it's like, how do you coordinate all of these environments? So, I don't know if environment is the right word. I kind of mean the operating system. I don't mean our environment, you know, within R. I'm talking about where R is running, things like that. And the sort of coordination of those R environments is, uh, is then a sort of important thing about if you have more than one, how, when do you start them up, when do you close them down, and all of that. So that's kind of my, how my thinking of R has sort of uh, evolved over the time. <clears throat> and this kind of mirrors the sort of cloud platform uh, philosophy. This is something I've lifted from Google, uh, from the cloud platform. <clears throat> and when you're sort of starting down the bottom here, you're just using virtual machines. And they're very sort of familiar. They're sort of a, basically a copy of the machine that you've got uh, sort of on your desk or something like that. And it's just a, another version of that running in the cloud. But then um, there's a lot of things that you set up on a machine each time. So what they, you can do is then sort of move up this abstraction where they take care of the details of launching the machines and you're just running the application on top of those machines. So that's sort of you move up to sort of where containers and clusters sort to came into play. And then as you move up, when you've got clusters of machines, maybe you don't need to know about the maintenance of a cluster of a machine. Maybe you should up, you know, give that to them as well. And so finally, you're just uploading code it's run, you set a few configuration things and then they're running it underneath. And what you gain as you sort of move up here is that you, uh, you get quicker to deployment and you're more uh, able to do sort of nicer things and all this, but you lose control, right? But as you, if you're down at the bottom here, you've got complete control, you configure it just as you have it on there, but you're going to have to spend a lot more time in doing that work. So it's kind of that's the trade-off of what you're looking to do. So, so for me, definitely the keystone between these two sort of environments uh, is Docker. And the Docker is the sort of keystone between these two sort of concepts. You've got R that you want to abstract into a fixed environment so that you can always run that, a dependable version of the R code that you're doing. And then for the cloud, you want uh, a system where you can run any application, any code on their systems and um, you know, know that the same result is going gonna, is gonna to happen. And so for R, I think that the, the problems of uh, reproducibility is really solved by Docker. I think that's like, you know, the reason that uh, they're really good mix together. I think they cover each other's weaknesses you know, really well in that respect. And for clouds, they're really embracing the standard of Docker. Like, I mean, I use Google, but all the other cloud providers are sort of using it as well. AWS, Azure, for example. And uh, yeah, so Docker is really kind of becoming the... Um, the lingua franca, the, the real sort of way cloud uh, communicates uh, with each other. And the thing is, is that once you've got it in Docker, the applications are, you've got a sort of unit of com computation for the R code, and you can move that to other platforms very easily. Um, so that's probably why Google have been quite a key component, uh, proponent of uh, Docker, because they're kind of the loser in the cloud wars at the moment. But you could like create something on the uh, Google Cloud, and then very easily pull it over to Azure or AWS. It's sort of using the same infrastructure. So it's a really good uh, time to be a, a, a customer of cloud at the moment because they're all kind of competing on price and, uh, and all of this. But it's very, very flexible to sort of uh, move your applications around uh, between the providers. So really for me, I mean, I don't think I could use uh, R in for the stuff that we do without Docker. I think uh, it really gives me the sort of peace of mind and it gets over a lot of the um, objections that maybe we get from clients about using R uh, in their environments. I mean, you know, IT, they don't know R. It's a kind of weird thing that statisticians use or something like that. And they don't have, you know, they're not, they don't feel safe with it. So, they, so when you ask for R to be installed, um, then they're like, oh, no, you, you know, I have to maintain it. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I don't want to do it. But because Docker is so, like, uh, ubiquitous these days, then if you say, well, can you use Docker? then they're probably running it already because it's sort of the, the thing that's sort of happening now. So it's much easier conversation to say, can you run my Docker container that contains R than can you install R in a lot of cases. And, uh, um, yeah, and so another thing is that version control that I was talking about because you can always pin down exactly the state of play 
uh, when you build that Docker container, it's, it's uh, because you're doing, at the time you're building this container is what it will be. So once you've got that Docker container running, then um, everything else can be updating, that will just keep going and uh, do the same thing every day. So it's a really good way of sort of like pinning down exactly what that code will be doing every day. And then it's scalable, because once you've got one Docker container, you can actually run many of them at the same time or in lots of different places. So, um, and that's sort of a criticism for us, like it all runs in RAM, so you can't really scale it and things like that. But once you've got kind of a way of scaling it on lots of machines all at once, that kind of doesn't really matter anymore because you can you know, run lots of machines more easily. <clears throat> so what I'd say is that Docker sort of levels the playing ground between all the languages in the cloud. I mean, um, and this is kind of a recent development, really, with uh, the adoption of, of Docker in the cloud. But um, before, in maybe the last five years, you'd had to use Python or Java or something like that, but one of the supported languages of the cloud, and they were picked sort of the most popular sort of development languages. But because now they're moving to where Docker can run any code, then basically it means that the strengths of R can be sort of given to people who maybe not, would not have used it before. So I really, I really think it's a, a good time to, uh, to be sort of running this sort of stuff, because yeah, Docker's kind of making use of that, it's democratizing it all, making it all level. <clears throat> and this is, this couldn't happen without the Rocker project, and so, you know, huge thanks to the Rocker project to, uh, on making this happen, they've kind of recognized this, uh, this need, and they've uh, really, you know, sort of gone forth and made these really sort of nice, dependable, and useful images that we can use uh, every day. So this is the Rocker project. If you're starting to use Docker and R, then this is the place to sort of start looking. <clears throat> and some useful ones they have is uh, we've got you can pin down to the various R versions. So 3.6.3 will just be coming out uh, right now. But you can sort of go back. Oh, it only works with 3.2 or something like that, and go back and sort of pick that one. Um, they've got an R Studio one. So if you want to quickly get an R Studio uh, server running, you can uh, use that. Uh, they've got the one with the R Studio and then the Tidyverse sort of installed on top of that, if you want to use that for data analysis. Um, we use it a lot for Shiny apps. They've just got one with Shiny apps installed, and you can run with that. And a really good recent one has been this machine learning GPU one. And I don't know if anyone's ever set up a GPU for uh, machine learning. It's just an utter nightmare uh, <laughs> to get sorted. Uh, there's these CUDA libraries and all this, and they kind of take care of that uh, with this uh, Docker image in here. So that's really been uh, really, really useful. And thanks very much to the team, one of which is here today. Um, and I think um, there's Gnome on here as well, which I need to update the slides so that uh, Gnome's on there as well. But yeah, these are the guys that are kind of making it all happen. So really big thanks to them. And if you haven't seen a Docker file before, this is kind of what it is. Um, the thing is, is that it's a text file that you can check in to version control. So this is kind of representing a complete um, virtual machine, a complete computer which is kind of crazy when you think about it. But um, if you, I kind of describe it like um, if you kind of got a new computer, a new Linux computer, and you needed to install R and R Studio and things like that, then the run commands here would be what you'd be typing in to, to set it up for the first time. And the thing is, once you've done that once for, for one computer, you don't want to keep doing that again each time you want to set up an environment. So this is kind of like a, a way of uh, yeah, setting up that machine in a text file. And then the very important thing is the from statement at the top. And the thing is that Docker containers can rely on other Docker containers. So you get this sort of dependency tree of going down, and it starts with maybe Debian, I think, is the first one that our version is built on top of. And then uh, RStudio is built on, on that one, and Tidyverse is built on that one. And then your own image can be built on top of these ones. So you get sort of a real good um, way of de controlling dependencies as well in that respect. And so this one here, is installing some of my languages from CRAN using a little utility uh, that uh, Dirk's got there, so install to .r, and then also you can do ones from GitHub as well, all, all the things that you need to do. So here comes the demo, <coughs> and um, yeah, this is why I didn't want to uh, <laughs> run a live demo, because I have, didn't have the internet, and this, this stuff is all in the internet. But uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> yeah, so what I've done is I've taken a video, cheated, but uh, hopefully this will uh, still get the same effect. I'll start on the rate this video as it goes. Um, so the first use case I want to kind of look at, that 
And these are, these are use cases that I have every day at work and, and so try to solve these use cases easily. And this is using the latest library that um, I talked about, this Google Cloud Runner. And um, yeah, so what this is doing is that you have a, an R Markdown document and you want that to update data daily. <coughs> you want that to have fresh data every time and then you want to host that uh, HTML in a place where the client can see it and uh, have a nice report and things like that. So um, this is the, me at home doing this. And uh, so here we have the R Markdown document as the demo. And this is going to be pulling in live data from Google Sheets. So we've got at the top bracket of the RMD, we're pulling in this uh, data from Google Sheets. And this Google Sheet could be updated. So each time you knit this uh, RMD file, you're going to get a new data within your R&D file. And this is what the R&D file produces. It's this kind of interactive JavaScript thing. Uh, very nice for the client, you know, all that, they love all that. So, uh, yeah, so we do all this. And um, so what I'm going to do with that R&D file is I'm going to upload this to Google Cloud Storage, which is a sort of place you can just put stuff. It's, uh, yeah, big blob storage uh, where you can put things. So I just up put, update that to a fresh version. I can pretend I'm doing this, if you like. <laughs> it wasn't a video. Yeah, um, yeah so, um, so now I've got a scheduled thing there. So now that's on cloud storage, and that's where it's going to come. So what I'm going to do now is load the library, Google Cloud Runner, and I'm going to make this thing, which is a cloud build YAML. And this is a neutral format. This is not an R format, but this is just an R client to make these um, files. And cloud build is, the, uh, is a service on... Um, Google Cloud Platform, which lets you run Docker containers, that lets you run code against Docker containers for each step. So what I'm doing here is just showing that if you want to do an R step, you've got this function called CR build step R. You pass in your R uh, stuff that you want to run, and then do that. So it's not a lot of code, is what I'm trying to sort of talk about. And it's generating this um, RMD file, this Cloud Runner YAML. And this is a YAML file that you could give to someone else who doesn't know R, and say, go run that and then my R code will execute, you know, for one thing. Because it's kind of neutral to R, it's not nothing to do with uh, R in itself. But we've got a client in R to sort of build that YAML file as we're going. Yeah? Um, this is really good. Um, Hang on, I need to the pause the video. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't need time for it. In the first example, when you start with the Google Sheet, and the Google Sheet is frozen on your disk or Google Drive or whatever, it has a static data, right? Where does the magic happen that the data then becomes live? So it's that build basically time. Basically, does, does in, the in the cloud, it would open the Google Sheet, and then it gets yes. basically the live links? Yes. Nice. So that's what I'm going to show. Yeah. Just, just a, um, As a side effect of having a Google Sheet in the Google Cloud. Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, it is, the Google Sheet could have been anything where it's pulling in data via R code. So I, I chose a Google Sheet because it's familiar. I, I but know, it could but be I an mean, API. The, the super elegant trick is that you're actually not writing code that pulls in data in the sense of connect to a database, open, fire up a query, collect the results. The sheet does it automatically, but you have to basically kick the sheet to become a live yeah. rather than a Yeah, so code. each build. So what I'm going to do is schedule this, um, this the knit of the R&D file. I'm going to schedule that knit, and that R code is going to run in the cloud. And that could be pulling in from Google Sheets, but it could be an API call, could be connecting to a database. It could be any, anything that R code can do in what we're doing. So yeah, so this is what this, this is doing right now. I've sent this off, off up into Cloud Build, and um, it launches the URL so that you can see the, um, the build happening. <coughs> and what it's doing first is it's downloading the uh, Docker file that's, uh, that's uh, doing stuff. And this is, not, this is a non-R Docker file at the moment, at the first step, because all I'm doing is downloading from Google Cloud Storage. So this is just using another non-R thing. I just did this to demonstrate you don't have to use R for all the steps. But for the other step, we, we are doing R code. <coughs> and this is R code that's running within a Docker container and um, can be tailored to have all the libraries that you need for, for what you need. So Google Sheets, for instance, was needed for this one. For your code, maybe you're calling an API or the database, things like that. So what you do is you, see, you can see now these steps are running, um, and we're pulling down the R code. <coughs> Actually, could have taken questions during this bit because it builds. It takes about a minute to build. Uh, can <laughs> to I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so where do you store the Docker images in, in Google Cloud? Or yeah. So you can store it on. You can have public Docker images in the Docker Hub like normal, but um, Google has a container uh, image repository as well. So you, you get that for free when you sign up for an account. 
So for private images, it's convenient to use that one. Um, but now we've actually got our code kind of executing, and, it's, and now it's saved this, uh, the results of the NIT uh, to a HTML file. And then this artifacts thing just at the top there is saying, uh, now I've built all this stuff, uh, the result should be served up into, on this URL. So now I go to that URL, and this is now live on the web on a public uh, URL. Um, so this is me just testing that it works, okay, just to see how to do it. So how do I schedule that? How do I make that a schedule? Well, this is really easy. You take the build object that you've just done, you pass it to this uh, schedule option. I did this demo twice, so I made a little error there. I should edit that out next time. Um, but now I'm going to do RDO demo 2, <coughs> and now, now that's scheduled. That's it. And so what that's going to do every time you schedule, you, that schedule runs, is it's going to run that cloud build with all the sort of fixed dependencies. It's all safe and everything. And now we see in the cloud scheduler interface, we've got this. It's a, it's a classic uh, cron syntax for when you want to run it. So you can do it every day, every month, or whatever you want to do. Um, and now I've just triggered one just to see if it worked from the schedule one. And if we go back to cloud build, we can see it started again. And that's going to run the same code, but pulling now from the latest version of the Google Sheets in this case. Yeah, and that's that. So uh, yeah, go back to there. And this will now just run every day, and it's been running uh, since I set this up for last week. Okay, was that all right? Get some uh, water now. So what I'm going to show now, uh, so that's okay. That's a common question. That's a common, a common reason to get into the cloud stuff is that to easily schedule stuff and usually do things like that. But what I wanted to show now is sort of more event-driven, um, more using the capabilities of cloud a lot more. And um, this batch stuff that we just talked about, it can take uh, it can take 24 hour long jobs and all that, but it wasn't that quick, right? You saw it, you know, it took a while to build. <laughs> so if you make an R API, which you can do so using Plumber, if you've heard of Plumber, it's a really great way of making uh, APIs out of R. If you host that Plumber API um, on a service called Cloud Run, then what you get is a scale to zero uh, to a billion um, R API, so R as a service, um, and yeah, you can use that to build websites or provide codes to non-R users, to other developers and things like that. Um, but yeah, but what I'm going to do now is uh, basically build uh, a Plumber API and host it on the Google Cloud in a, in a similar process. So the R code that I'm going to run now is just going to send an email. I mean, this could be any R code that you want to do, just for demo purposes, I want to send an email. And what this is going to do also is like, we're going to use PubSub, which is another service for massive um, <coughs> Uh, messaging system within the Google Cloud. And um, what this is going to do is every time I push up uh, a file to Google Cloud Storage, so maybe you're receiving a file from a client or there's new data available and they push it up uh, to there, then um, yeah, we're going to get an, an email saying it's ready. So this is the Docker file for, for doing this, and this is just loading Plumber and the uh, default. Now I used code before, but now I'm going to use the uh, RStudio add in that's in the package as well to try and make this even easier. Because um, this is a common workflow for me, so I wanted just to have a little form to, to do this instead. So now I select Plumber. I select the location of my uh, uh, API. Um, and I'm going to call it something great, GCS. PubSub. Yeah, so this is saying every time a file hits Google Cloud Storage, I want it to send a message to PubSub. Then our API is going to pick up that PubSub message and send an email. But that send an email is the running R code, and that could be any R code that you want to do. So do statistical analysis, um, you know, run an RMD file, uh, anything like that. So now I'm submitting that, and we're, we're back in the sort of cloud build thing interface to uh, deploy this. <clears throat> and this takes about five minutes to do. Well, I mean, there's a bit of setup at the start of the library, but once you've, uh, once you've got it all set up, then... Um, the, it's really quick to iterate through and uh, update your R code to, oh, I need this, need this, redeploy, have a test, and see what it looks like. So a good green tick is always good. Um, yeah, so now what we've got is, this is the, if you use Plumber, this is the, um, the demo that comes with Plumber. So this is it works, and this it works means that R code is executing. 
Yeah. So it might not look impressive, but it means that this R API is um, running HTML, and that's the sort of HTML I've got at the top. And just to prove that it is R code, I'm now going to another endpoint that's sort of in the Plumber demo docs, this plot, and this is plotting uh, the uh, Iris data set in that. You can see that it's, it has been running uh, uh, R code to, to do so. And now we're going to run our PubSub endpoint. <coughs> now PubSub, what it is another service that I'm starting up here, and what I'm going to add here is the endpoint of the R API that we've just deployed, and we're going to go to the PubSub uh, message. So, and what this, what this uh, PubSub message will do is send a message every time I add a uh, file to cloud storage. And I'm just going to test this directly. You can test this endpoint directly with this function just to see if it's uh, returning any, anything there. In this case, I said the test file from R, this is just to sort of test it, and I got an email. It, it went bing, but I haven't got any sound, so let's crack on. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've got this test file from R. So this is proving that the, the infrastructure is working, right? So now, using Google Cloud Storage R, I'm going to upload a file simulating a client adding data to a bucket we've prearranged via an API or just dragging and dropping. And there I get the email saying that. But bear in mind that email represents that any R code has run. And we've just chosen email in, in this case. So that's pretty much it for that one. So, so what this means for me is that we are now in an event-driven R place. So for various events, and this PubSub thing can happen for every kind of event that's within uh, the Google Cloud platform, um, you can run R code. And that's really massively powerful because this can scale up as well. So if I put on like a million, uh, well maybe not a million, 10,000 files on Google Cloud Storage at the same time, it will scale and, and have a hit for each one at the same time and then give the results uh, to the analysis that's going on. So it really makes uh, you be able to scale up big data flows and things like that over a lot of things. Cool. <clears throat> so now I've got to find where I am. Yeah, that's okay. So yeah, I mean, these are the use cases I've got, but I think it's very general to a lot of things. Another use case that I'm using is it actually helped build the package itself. Every time I'm uh, pushing to GitHub, that is an event. So what it's doing every time I push to GitHub, it's doing a CRAN check against the package, it's identifying any problems, and giving an email saying, yeah, this has happened. It's also building the website every time I commit to CRAN. So I don't have to worry too much on the documentation and things like that. So um, yeah, it's really, yeah, it's really making a difference uh, to my day-to-day -day work. Okay, so I haven't got that long left, so but I really want to just sort of talk about the, uh, the mindset. And this is like how I got to where we just sort of looked there, um, how I arrived at that sort of thinking. So the first thing, and I think a lot of people will do this first, is that they, they're trying to run a computation on RStudio locally or something like that, or R, and they just don't have enough resources. And they're like, okay, maybe the cloud will be able to solve this. And so what they want to do is then launch a version of the uh, computer that they have locally. They want to have one in the cloud as well. Okay? And so Google Compute Engine R facilitates this with these template system, and every time you use a template, you're using a Docker container. And the Docker containers are the ones from Rocker. And uh, this is one using RStudio. And it's basically filling in the parameters you need for the uh, RStudio to work. And this is what I did first. And it means that you could maybe fire up, and it goes up to like 96 uh, terabytes of RAM, ridiculous, or something like that, that you can fire up. These are very expensive, but you can do it. Um, yeah, so if you've, got, if you've got a big job that won't fit in the RAM of your machine, and you just want to spin it up something quickly and do it, then that might be an option for you. <clears throat> but I don't think, yeah, I don't do this very often anymore because it, I don't think it uses the cloud to its full potential. Because what I was doing is just trying to duplicate what I had. I had off-cloud thinking of what I was doing. I just wanted to duplicate what I was doing. So what I started to do then, because we had these Docker containers, it's like actually you're not, you're not charged for these VMs when they're not being used. So you can actually set up individual RStudio environments for each sort of individual task that you have. So this has been really helpful for workshops, because I don't know if you've ever run an R workshop, but the first like half an hour, hour is spent like, how do you install this? How do you install this package or this on all the different systems? So it's really helpful to have a sort of set environment for the workshops just to uh, carry on going. 
That machine learning um, data is really, really helpful. I, I don't have GPUs on my little MacBook Air here, uh, which will do the job. So just firing up a deep learning. Uh, and this is the, I basically wrote this because I was reading Deep Learning with R, the book, and I, need, I can do it on my laptop. So I was like, okay, I need a GPU-based uh, VM to do so. So this code here will give you a GPU with a NVIDIA Tesla K80 GPU. And you can put, you add up to eight GPUs to these VMs, so make a huge, powerful machines. And then if you're just using package sets like Tidyverse, SF, or something like that, they're, they're sort of special environments that could be set up for that. So that's still using VMs though, right? We're still at the bottom of that sort of infrastructure of things. <clears throat> and then I don't know if Henrik's here today. I would really love to, love to meet Henrik. But Henrik, uh, he wrote this library Future, and Future is like a really sort of helpful interface on how to parallelize uh, R code. And then we've got this S3 method that uses Google uh, Compute Engine R, and now we can set up a cluster with GCM VM cluster that sets up uh, three or four or 10 VMs that you want to do. And then you run this uh, using the future infrastructure, you can run your code against all those machines in parallel. And this is definitely the biggest use case that people come to use this library for, is like how to sort of parallelize my computation over many, many machines. And so this is then from your local session, you, you sort of just make this cluster, and then in your local session, you send up this function and the data, and it runs all that in parallel across all of those machines. And that's the code to do it. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> and then, yeah, so I just wanted to sort of say that the, what it starts to do is when um, we had these sort of, uh, when you're starting to think of R in just sort of Docker containers, what it sort of forces you to do is separate out the things that you're doing. So you've got R computation in the docking container, and then your data should be separate from that. You don't want to sort of put it all together because that uh, decreases the scalability of what you're doing. So it getting, and this is a good data science thing anyway, right? You shouldn't be, you should be making reproducible stuff so that your functions are not connected to your data. And that really translates well to the Google Cloud or cloud infrastructures as well. So that's a sort of good thing to, to be keeping in mind. And then I was running all these Docker containers on the Google Compute Engine thing, but it's so transferable. So these are sort of lists of some of the <coughs> containers I've done for Google Compute Engine. But then as new services came on board, like Cloud Run and Cloud Builds that we were talking about earlier, then I could just move the same Docker container over into that platform, and then it just works on that. And I could do, equally, I could move it to AWS or Azure or something like that, and it would just work. <coughs> So I'm going to skip Kubernetes because that's a big subject. And um, yeah, just this is the final thing is just to say these was like how Cloud Build works. It's like it's pulling in Docker containers, it's running that code, and you get sort of nice uh, UI to sort of look at how it's going. And then Cloud Run is trigger R and events, and that's these are the two things that are really kind of where I am at the moment. So this is my current. This, if I get a, a job and I sort of put my R into a Docker container, these are my options, and this is what I kind of tend to do. So if I'm looking to do some GPU work or machine learning dev work, then I'll fire up that VM and sort of do that on the, on the VM. If I'm using Shiny apps, then I'm putting it on Kubernetes, which is a platform for running a lot of docking containers in, in general. Um, if I'm doing batched and scheduled jobs, which is like, I don't know, 75% of all the stuff that I'm doing, then Cloud Build is the, is the service that I'm using by the Google Cloud Runner uh, library. And then Cloud Run is for R APIs and event driven workflows where you need that immediate feedback and run the R code. And the nice things about this is that it, it, it democratizes R. It means that R does, you don't have to install R to use R, which is a really kind of powerful thing uh, when you're working with clients. So, time wise, <laughs> so um, for me, abstracting R using Docker has just opened up the horizons of what you can do. And it's, um, yeah, really made my job easier in doing so. And what cloud offers, the offer proposition is it makes hard things easy. I mean, the things that we've been talking about here, that is virtually free for what's doing. You only start paying once you get to sort of a million API calls, um, more than 120 minute build time a day. That's when you uh, start to pay. And then separating out that code and data and configuration really helps uh, scale you up and be able to be flexible in where you're moving, um, where you're putting this code. So I just want to make sure I get time to say thank you for listening, and thanks to Anne for inviting me. I kind of emailed and said, "Please can I, please can I come?" Uh, so uh, thank you for accepting. Uh, thank you very much for the R core team. I mean, this is all you know, 
because of you. So thanks for, you know, awesome. Thanks to Ask Geo for all their cool things. Rocker is, you know, it rocks my world. And thanks to Google for the Developer Expert Program, which has given me access to this kind of thing. And that's it. Thank you. Questions or comments from up? Oh, tons of them. Yeah, let's go here. It's very cool, the cloud part. But I was wondering, now with this new GDPR rule for personal data, how could we use the cloud? That's, I mean, it's a, the tools really don't matter for GDPR, it's the intent. So if you're putting up data that is pers can be linked back to a person, then it doesn't matter what tool you're using, you need to have legal guidelines in place to protect that user. So the agreement that I'm doing in doing this with the cloud? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, Google class themselves as a data processor. So, and in the GDPR term, so that means that... Uh, you need to, yeah, they need to take care of the security and things like that. And then you as a data controller, if you're doing it on a behalf of a, of a client, you need to do due diligence to make sure they've got all of that in place. But then as you as a data controller are responsible for the, if you're using that for um, uh, privacy reasons or identifying users and things like that. So that's where the, um, the sort of, in GDPR terms, where it, where it comes in. But ask me about that. It's a big, obviously a big subject at the moment. <laughs> so something about the Gargle package also. Uh, Sorry, which one? Isn't it called Gargle, the one that is... Oh, Gargle, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you said that uh, the stuff that you have been doing before is now being kind of offloaded to them. What kind of stuff is that? Is that the authentication part of it yeah. only? Or? Yeah, they're basically doing the same features. And uh, now Gargle is a hard dependency for Google Author. And uh, a lot of the functions are now just sort of wrappers of the Gargle implementation. So the, the Google author has uh, had these functions and they're doing the same ones. So I'm just soft wrapping just to make sure it doesn't break everything going on. But um, go, once we get feature parity in what Gargle and Google author can do, then you'll be able to just use Gargle directly without having Google author sort of as the go-between. And the basic idea is just to offload it to, to other people. Yeah, that, uh, because, I mean, Jenny works for Art Studio, and she's paid to do it, right? Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, yeah. and I'm not. <laughs> That's a focus. Yeah. So, yeah, if I get run over by bus tomorrow or something like that, then um, there'd be no more updates, you know. I mean, that's the dream of open source, that someone will come in and take over. But, um, yeah, it's much more, uh, I feel a lot more safer having, knowing that, you know, a, com a company is looking up for that. Oh, just shout. <laughs> so, uh, this rocker thing seems really cool. Do you know if there's one that's wrapping the whole TensorFlow keras because there you also need Python and everything running together? Yeah. There is. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can answer that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's no one. Um, so, that's a relatively recent, recent contribution. Uh, that was really impressive, and I really liked that. I have found when I try to explain um, Docker and the differences, I try really hard to avoid the term virtual machine. Okay. Because for those of us who have worked with virtual machines, yeah. that has left <laughs> that <You're> taste. Like, <laughs> because they're yeah. generally sort of heavy, slow, yeah. resource intensive, and the and I just, you know, started doing these because I first talked about this, I mean, years years ago in, in Docker itself, with all the problems that with marketing and branding and renaming things, whatever, they had useful <coughs> slides about comparing this to VMs, that generally where it wins is that it's not a VM. Yeah. Because particularly when you're hosted on Linux and you don't see it with the cloud where you host it, so it is Linux, the shims are very small, very minimal, and it's almost the same as running native code. Yeah. We're getting all these encapsulation benefits that you, yeah. that so you, that's a big that you highlighted. And the yeah. thing that's then the genius is that in order to simulate that behavior, you get the same on a Mac or now natively on Windows 2 because it puts enough shim in to allow that, which beforehand always required a VM, but now it's no more VM. Yeah, so no almost, more VMs. Almost the yeah. biggest thing because that yeah. gets us to the fact that we can, um, that we can run so many of them on the same limited hardware. Yeah. So an analogy that I came up with, that I mean, I'm, it's not that strong, but it was helpful, is that I tend to talk about Docker as runnable zip files because everybody knows what a zip file is, the thing that's, that's self-contained, you can give it to the next person, and there's close to no requirement for executing it. They just have to go off, put a Docker client in, and then they can run with the code. And it's also light <coughs> enough that when we can, they, 
spray many of them and where the, where the orchestration comes in, as, you, as you've shown, where, where real power. That makes comes. sense. Yeah, I'll use that from now on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Five cents a use case. Yeah. <laughs> one, one more question. After a million. Each quick. Yeah. quick question. Uh, the, sorry, you are you, a long time. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah, so def uh, it's it's good. So cl cloud storage. If you're using the cloud storage and the VM, you can you can define the project and zones that they're in. And so if you run them in the same zone, then the performance is really good. And um, it's def it's not been a problem. Obviously, it depends on the size of your data and what's what's happening and all of that. Um, yeah, but I mean, also there are there are a lot of database uh, solutions which are a lot more performant than uh, running a huge. CSV file or RDS in R anyway. So I think once I get past you know a certain limit, I'm putting it in a database uh, anyway, and then calling that from the from the R code. And if it's small enough that it doesn't seem to make a difference, then I'm calling it from as an RDS file from Google Cloud Storage. And um, yeah, I mean even from the laptop and you know going the ping and all that, it seems to be pretty quick in what sense. Because it does one job well for Google Cloud Storage, which is store data and transfer it. That's like the only thing it does, but yeah. So it's been, um, it depends on your size and shape of data, but yeah. Usually it's the performance has not been, has been good, in my experience. If you've got any more questions, please find me in the break. I've got my email as well, and things like that. So, uh, and I really love Twitter as well, so say hello on Twitter as well. Let's uh, thank Mark again.